Today's notes are about the origin of life and the endosymbiotic theory. We talked about how organisms developed into more complex organisms from simpler ones, but we didn't really talk about where the original life uh, organisms came from. So that, that's the topic for today. Um, we are talking about the uh, things from the beginning of Earth, from the formation of Earth. Uh, the whole solar system was formed between 10 and 20 billion years ago, probably around 15 to 17 billion years ago. And geologists infer that about 4 billion years ago, the Earth cooled enough to have solid rocks. It took a while. It was pretty hot, as you can imagine. The early atmosphere of Earth would have been made of many poisonous gases like hydrogen cyanide, which is poisonous, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, which smells really bad, and water vapor. But notice there's no oxygen there. So it would have been very hospi inhospitable, poisonous atmosphere. Earth was still very hot. There was no liquid water. But about by, by about three and a half billion years ago, um, Earth had cooled enough for water to remain a liquid. And once that happened, then when that water vapor condensed and fell down out of the sky onto the land, it would, able, would be able to run off and collect into basins and would begin to form lakes and then oceans. As those oceans formed, they were rich in organic compounds that had been uh, washed off of the off of the rocks and formed in the oceans by means of chemical reactions. But how did all of that come about? How did we get those organic compounds from the inorganic substances that were probably in the original rocks in the early atmosphere? Back in 1924, um, a scientist named Oprin came up with an idea that life had originated by chance from non-biologic sources. Uh, synthesis of organic molecules from inorganic ones using energy from lightning and sunlight. In other words, living, it could have formed, uh, organic compounds could have formed without the benefit of living things. This was pretty controversial at the time, still remains some some circles today. Here's the hypothesis. It's called the spontaneous generation of life, that life developed through natural, chemical, and physical processes. Although it was pretty controversial at the time, it's widely accepted by scientists today as probably the way things happened. So let's talk about how you would go about finding out about that. Of course, we can't go back in time to be an Earth, early Earth, and see what it was really like. We can infer things about, about the elements that were present and what kind of forms they had based on fossils and looking at the, at the rock record, but um, there's not really any way to prove it. However, in 1953, a couple of other scientists named Miller and Urey came up with an experiment to, uh, to provide evidence to support Oprin's hypothesis. So here's what they did. They took a closed system here, uh, put some distilled water in it. This was all uh, sterilized and purified to make sure there was no, no living things there. They put distilled water in here, applied a heat source to boil the water, which then became water vapor and rows in the column. In a second chamber, they put a combination of, of gases that could have been present in Earth's early atmosphere. There's some disagreement now as to, as to the gases that they chose, but they chose things that would have the elements that would be necessary to produce organic compounds. So methane gas, ammonia gas, hydrogen gas, along with the water vapor, provided the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen that would have been necessary for the formation of proteins. Uh, they also included some electrodes uh, to, to simulate the production of electricity by lightning and, ex and let the system run for a period of time. So what happens is the, the water vapor, the water boils, the water vapor rises, joins with these other gases. Electricity is there. As the gases flow through the system, they pass through a condenser that cools things off and condenses the, the fluids back into water, which collect at the bottom, and then travel back into the original system. And so it recirculates over and over again. They let the system run for a period of time, and then they siphoned off some of the, of the uh, liquids down here for chemical analysis. And what they found was that some amino acids had been formed. Now that was a pretty important thing because up until that time, nobody thought you could make amino acids or other kinds of organic compounds in the laboratory. And they showed that it was possible for these to form as a result of natural chemical processes. So they formed amino acids in, a, in 
uh, a, a somewhat primitive atmosphere, probably not the original primitive atmosphere of Earth, but something simi similar to that. They, f they were formed from inorganic molecules with natural energy sources of lightning and sunlight. And so this was an important step in order showing that it was possible that life could have, the molecules necessary for life could have developed from inorganic, natural, um, naturally occurring um, processes. So organic polymers would be the next step. You take those amino acids, you put them together and make proteins, nucleic acids or other organic compounds could have formed in on at early earth on those hot rocks and clay in the primitive oceans that were full of all those molecules that had washed off of the surface. The first genetic material was probably RNA rather than DNA because it's less complex and more uh, adaptable, more flexible than DNA is. The first enzymes were probably ribozymes, which were enzymes based on RNA, and they catalyzed some of those early chemical reactions. Now, over time, those uh, early molecules would have uh, continued to uh, exist in the, in the hot climate, in the water. More chemical processes, more chemical reactions could occur. And eventually, the formation of polymers and groups of polymers could have formed. Um, when you keep some of these molecules together in solutions, they do sometimes congregate together and form little spheres with, a, with actually a membrane, which can form around them. The naturally occurring lipids could have, could have congregated together and formed a membrane. And some of these things have been shown to happen in the laboratory. Over time, a very long period of time, some of these may have evolved into, into the early um, prokaryotes, archaebacteria. About three and a half billion years ago, uh, or the oldest, the, about three and a half billion years, the oldest fossils that have been found on Earth are fossilized mats of photosynthetic bacteria called stromatolites. Now, the picture here shows some modern day stromatolites. These are in Australia. These are pretty big, okay? They're probably about, uh, about two feet high, two feet or three feet high, and several feet in diameter around. And they're just layers upon layers upon layers of, of mats of photosynthetic, better, photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria. Fossils of these are found in numerous places, including some in Texas. And when you look at them, you can see they just look like um, a lot of concentric circles of things. And you, when you look at them microscopically, you can see the little individual cells that are in there. And so those are about the oldest fossils found on Earth about three and a half billion years ago. These, uh, over time, would have developed from chemosynthetic organisms and, and eventually produced some photosynthetic prokaryotes that could produce oxygen as a result of photosynthesis. And as oxygen was produced and collected in the atmosphere, it definitely had an effect on Earth's early atmosphere. The earliest organisms were probably most likely anaerobic because there wasn't any free oxygen. Most of them were probably obligate anaerobes, meaning that when oxygen was collected in large amounts in the atmosphere, it probably killed them off unless they lived deep in the ocean or in mud or down in the soil or something like that. But the production of oxygen by these photosynthetic prokaryotes made life possible for aerobic organisms. Over time, various kinds of organisms evolved from very small prokaryotes, including the cyanobacteria, the photosynthetic organisms. Uh, eventually, some of those prokaryotes became symbionts, or living in larger cells and, and cooperating with larger cells. That's producing eukaryotic cells. The eukaryotic cells uh, could have developed into living in colonies. Within a colony, some of the cells could have been specialized to do different jobs, eventually producing multicellular organisms, later organisms with tissues or groups of cells with special jobs, and finally into more complex organisms with organ systems. But all of this had to come back, come about from the development of, of eukaryotic cells, and that's going to be our next topic, which is the endosymbiotic theory. Back in the 1960s, there was a scientist named Lynn Margulis who came up with a theory to explain the formation of eukaryotic cells. Um, the earliest cells were simple prokaryotes. Most of them were chemosynthetic. Some were photosynthetic. And her theory is that eukaryotic cells arose from living communities of 
between prokaryotic cells, symbiotic relationships that developed as a result of some larger cells ingesting or eating smaller cells that they found to be beneficial to keep as is inside them rather than digesting them. And you can imagine if you, if you ingested a cell that was really good at taking the sugars and releasing a whole lot of energy more than you could, it would be uh, advantageous to keep that oxidizing bacterium inside you as a separate cell or a separate part of the cell to produce energy for you. Or if you ingested a cell that could use sunlight to produce lots of food, more food than it could use and enough for you to use too, it would be an advantage to keep that inside of you. And so that, was, that would be the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. There is an activity about the endosymbiotic theory. If you have not done it, it's posted on Enmodo and you can access it there. You need to complete it um, by Tuesday, and we'll talk about it more in class at that time.